We're talking about the Old Testament. We're talking about Genesis 1 to 11 and what it means. And we're going to use uh, the book Reading Genesis Well by John C. Or C. John Collins as our jumping off point. Now, where are we starting when we talk about Genesis 1 to 11? There are a lot of different starting places that you can take. For us at Ratio Christi, we are starting from the traditional, you know, American evangelical, you know, 21st century position. Um, and the most important presuppositions here, I think, to lay out are that we are starting from a position assuming biblical inspiration and also biblical inerrancy. Now, we talked a little bit about that last week and the week before. Those can be loaded terms. So, a little bit more about what I mean. So, here is a good uh, summary of biblical inspiration. This comes from uh, the organization called Ligonier Ministries. This was started by R.C. Sproul, who was actually one of the signers of the Chicago Statement on Bi Biblical Inerrancy. And specifically, I think the organic inspiration part here is what's most interesting, which basically says the text is truly the work of the human author. God did not typically dictate to them as, a, as to a stenographer. Um, yet, the Lord stands behind it as the ultimate source. So they use their own literary styles. My computer wanted to restart. I said, don't restart. Um, so they use their own literary styles, their own personal style, uh, and their personalities and the, the environment that they, they live in comes through their writing. Now, as an important note, this is very different from Islam. In Islam, they typically do hold to a dictation theory of inspiration where every word is literally dictated by Allah, and Muhammad doesn't really play any role in the content. So you shouldn't look at uh, the Quran and try to see the human author in the text. Uh, but in Christianity, we do expect to see the human author in the text and their unique situation to be reflected in the text. Now, the a little bit more specific uh, topic of biblical inerrancy um, obviously, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but a couple of few key lines from the Chicago Statement I've pulled out uh, that I want to remind you of. So the first is that Scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching. So that word teaching is important. Uh, secondly, we affirm that God in his work of inspiration utilized the distinctive personalities and literary styles of the writers. So this is going to become very important here in a minute or so. So, Starting back in the past, about 150, 60 years ago. So uh, this is where C. John Collins starts in his book. So that's where we're, where we're going to start. So in 1860, there was a famous book uh, or collection of essays, really, published in London called Essays and Reviews. Now, it has an innocuous title, but this was very influential and a significant book because it was basically translating the theological and textual positions of uh, the German liberals into the English-speaking world. And so the essays inside of this volume deny pre predictive prophecy, deny the possibility of miracles, they uh, critique harmonies between uh, Genesis and science, uh, and most importantly, they have a plea uh, to treat the Bible like any other piece of literature. So an important part of this discussion was that these authors in this critical publication um, put forth, uh, one of them in particular, put forth this criteria for scripture that you have to consider the plain meaning of the text, right? So we've probably all heard this phrase before, but interestingly, in this case, this is being used by cri uh, critics of traditional kind of uh, conservative Christianity. Um, and they're using this as, as a way to discredit the Bible. So in this case, uh, remember this is 1860, so this is before most of the scientific uh, issues that we have today. Um, they're pointing to Copernicus. So obviously the Old Testament clearly is specifying that the earth is immobile, that it doesn't move, that it's the center of everything. So we know from Copernicus that the earth moves around the sun, Therefore, the Bible, in its plain meaning, is false. 
So additionally, they uh, would say that from in, in respect to Genesis 1, that it, it is clearly intended to teach, uh, at least in part, some physical truth um, in its kind of plain sense. So the traditional Christians at the time responded in a couple different ways. The first way was to reject science and develop replacement theories. So this is like creation science today. So this was going on 150 years ago. Uh, or concordism. So trying to mesh the scientific theories into what the Bible said. Um, for one, uh, one example would be an appeal to phenomenological language. Um, unfortunately, though, both of these groups, at least some of them, accepted this gauntlet laid down by the, by the critics that you had to accept Scripture with its plain sense, right? So this is basically putting forth a requirement for some kind of literalism when you read Scripture. So this carried on among critical scholars uh, into the more contemporary area, era. So James Barr died in 2006. He was a fairly influential um, theologian. Um, and he wrote a lot about fundamentalism. He was not a fundamentalist. I don't even know that he was a Christian at all. Um, maybe he was, but very definitely very critical of fundamentalism. Uh, and he is, he is supporting this idea that you have to have a literal reading of the text. And he actually will attack fundamentalists saying that they're selective in their application of that principle, and they will apply the literal meaning in cases where it suits them and then not in other cases. Um, and for some reason, a fair number of contemporary evangelical scholars still will follow Barr and use his positions um, to defend their position, even though he was a critique of, um, he was basically saying that the Bible was false because taken literally, it says things that are false. So this kind of leaves us to where we are today, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. We have this tug of war between literalism and you know, non-literalism when we're talking about the Bible, at least, at least with respect to certain parts of the Bible. There are lots of parts of the Bible that, at least within Christianity, we don't care about this question. But when it comes to Genesis 1 through 11, we care a lot about it. So the two camps are basically saying, on the one hand, if the Bible isn't literal, then it can't be true. Like, if it's not literal, it's not true, so what's it matter for, like, if God said it, it must be true, right? If, if something's wrong, then God couldn't have said it, so just throw it away. But on the other hand, we say if the Bible is literal, it says things that aren't true, therefore it can't be true. So which side do you fall on? See? So the question that we're going to, this is basically the question we're trying to answer today. Where do you fall on this? Where do you go when you're talking about literalism in Genesis in particular? What's literal? What's not literal? How do you decide? So ultimately what we're doing here is, uh, is biblical interpretation. This is hermeneutics. This is the technical term which is the science of interpreting a text, particularly scripture. Ultimately, the goal here is to discover the meaning. Okay, we want to know what the text means. What is it teaching? What is it affirming? So those are the words that come from the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. We care about what the, teach, what the text teaches and what it affirms. That's what we want to know. So when we're trying to search for this, this meaning, we have to ask, where does, like, where is the meaning held? Where does the meaning live? Does the meaning live in the mind of the reader? This is called subjectivism. So if you think that the meaning lives in the mind of the reader, what this means is there is no objective meaning. Every reader can have their own meaning. Which means that if you ask the question, well, is the earth 6,000 years old or 13 billion years old? Well, that's the universe. But if you ask that question, there is no answer if the meaning, it, well, there is no answer with respect to Genesis if the meaning is subjective. Every person will read the text and get an answer, and that answer is for them, but it can't be, it's not, there's no generally true answer. Now, additionally, there's also a different kind of subjectivism that we employ frequently in Christianity, is, 
This is when you open up your Bible study book and it says, what does this mean to you? Okay, that's not what we're looking for though. We're not looking for some individual thing. We're looking for what the text means objectively insofar as that's possible to determine. To determine. So the second option is that the meaning lies within the words themselves of the text. Okay? This, is, uh, this can lead to the word study trap. So this idea that if I just read the way this word is used in every, book, every place in the book of Genesis, then I'll know what the word means, and then I'll know what the text means. But this doesn't work because words can be used in lots of different ways, right? So if I just say the word bat, what does that mean? Is that a wooden implement used to hit a ball? Uh, is it a flying mammal? Right, the word itself only has meaning in its context. And if I said something about a bat, even in a sentence, you might not be able to tell the difference you might not be able to tell which of those two meanings it is without having broader context to the conversation, right? So you can't just look at only the text. Importantly, and we'll get to this later, this is because when authors create texts, they don't include all of the background information. You can't, actually. There's too much background information. If I said something about the 2020 presidential election, you all know a whole lot about that. So when I say that, it has a lot of meaning. If I had said the 2020 presidential election in 1980, all they would have known is, oh, 2020 election, so it's an election. They wouldn't know Donald Trump. They wouldn't know Biden. They wouldn't know any of the other things going on because they don't have the same shared experience that we do. So we'll get to that. So that leaves us with the final option, which is the author. So the idea here is that ultimately, the meaning that is being conveyed by a text is specified by its author. Now, it is possible that an author will have a meaning in mind, write a text, and fail at communicating that. But ultimately, the purpose of that text is to convey the author's meaning. So when God inspires a human being to write a text that will become scripture, God and the author are creating something that has meaning, and that meaning is defined by the author. It's not defined by anything else, right? at least insofar as it can be known. So here's a nice quote from C.S. Lewis. So one of the things I haven't told you so far is that in uh, John Collins' book, one of the main things that he does um, to kind of frame this question is by looking at C.S. Lewis. Because C.S. Lewis was a philologist and a linguist and a, study, a student of folklore and myths, and, and he, he worked in this world of understanding old texts. This is what he did. And he was also uh, an important, uh, you know, evangelical type Christian. So there's this really nice quote from C.S. Lewis. The idea that any man or writer should be, should be opaque to those who lived in the same culture, spoke the same language, and shared the same habitual Im imagery and unconscious assumptions, and yet be transparent to those who have none of these advantage, is in my opinion a preposterous. So basically he's saying that the, the, uh, the ancient Israelite understood what Genesis meant. We, just on the face of it, aren't going to understand that because we don't share that shared world. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little more detail here. So when we are talking about trying to understand the meaning of a text, there's this key concept called cooperation. So if some author is trying to convey meaning through written words or spoken words, the only way you can access that meaning is if you cooperate with the author, because the author is going to assume that you're going to approach the text in a certain way. So you have to try to figure out the way that the author wants you to approach it, and then you have to cooperate with him in that, uh, in that attempt in order to get to meaning that is what the author is intending. If you don't cooperate with the author, then you're not going to have a good result. So just like if you are trying to uh, pull a canoe on shore with two people, if one of those people just kind of flops down in the canoe and doesn't cooperate, you're not going to get that canoe out of the water, right? So you have to cooperate with the ancient author. Don't be uncooperative. Let the author lead, because we don't get to decide what the author was trying to do. That's the author's prerogative. 
In fact, a lack of cooperation and communication can create jokes. So here's a nice joke here at the bottom that was relayed by William Lane Craig. Uh, he says, there's a knock at the door and a man tells his robot, robot, go answer the door. And the robot dutifully approaches the door and says, yes, door, what was it that you asked? See, so that is taking the literal meaning of those words, but it's not cooperating with the author in the author's intent, right? So a couple technical terms that I'm going to throw out, and we probably won't use these again, um, but I, I found these personally helpful when I was reading um, Collins's book. These are locution and illocution. So the locution is the actual words in a text, whereas the illocution is the intended effect of those words on the reader. So this is one of those key things that you, you need to distinguish. Separate in your mind what the words of the text are from what the author is trying to accomplish with those words. Because that's what we're trying to get at. What is the author actually trying to communicate? Not just what are the words. Okay? Okay, so we're almost to the meat. And we've only spent 25 minutes. I think we're doing pretty good. So what does a piece of literature mean? So again, Collins relies heavily on C.S. Lewis. And this quote from C.S. Lewis kind of forms an outline of some of the things we're going to talk about. So the first qualification for judging any piece of workmanship from a corkscrew to a cathedral is to know what it is, what it was intended to do, and how it is meant to be used. So any of those uh, of you in the audience who are engineers probably instinctively recognize this when he talks about something like a corkscrew or a cathedral, right? Obviously, if you don't know what some mechanical implement is for, you can't begin to judge it in any, any way at all, right? You can't understand anything about it until you know what it was for and what it's supposed to do. Lewis is saying that this is the same thing for an ancient text. Until you know these things, you can't really know much of any importance about the text itself. So we're going to talk about these three things. However, we're going to spend the vast majority of our time on the first one, and then we're going to just briefly talk about the second, the last two, because the first one is probably where the most controversy will lie. Okay, so I gave these three questions that we're going to address. So the first one is, what is it? So some of the examples of what we mean by this are what is the literary form? What is the genre, style, and register? So we'll talk a little bit about those later. Uh, our second question was what is it intended to do? So this is what is it supposed to do to the audience? Right? When you read a text, the author is trying to do something to you, whether that's just communicate information or change your opinions or form a worldview. We'll get to that. And then lastly, how is it meant to be used? What kind of audience is envisioned? What kind of knowledge and beliefs do they share with the author? And what is the social setting for the intended use? Now, all of these things can be called context. So probably all of you at some point have done a Bible study and you've talked about reading the Bible in context. Now, usually what that means is read the verse before and after. Or sometimes if you're really ambitious, the whole chapter. But believe it or not, the context of Scripture is more than just the verse before and after. It's more than just the chapter or even the book or even all the books that Paul wrote, right? It's all of the Bible, but it's also all of the environment that that author lived in. So if you want to understand some of the things Paul says, you have to understand the way he was interacting in this Hellenistic world, right? Between Judaism and the Greeks and how those things intermesh. And when he's writing to a Jewish audience, he's not saying the same sorts of things as when he's writing to a mainly Gentile audience, right? So you have to understand the world, not just the verse before and after. So this is the broader discussion of context, and that's what we're trying to get at today. So first question, we're going to tackle this. Like I said, this is going to be long. I'm going to try to go fast, but if somebody has a question or something, just let me know. And I will try to slow down and maybe answer a question if we have any confusion. So what is it? So 
I said we'd talk about these categories a little bit. So there are a lot of different ways that you can categorize written texts. Um, you can think of these all as different dimensions of measurements that you can make about a text, but they're not all linearly independent. So those of you who are into math know what that means. If you don't, that's okay. So we have literary form. So this is basically the arrangement or organization within a text. So how is it actually structured? We have genre. So this is a social and communicative act with its associated linguistic, rhetorical, and literary conventions. That's a very scholarly, scholar ease definition, but it's basically the actual communication itself plus a variety of the context. Register, again, is kind of a, a grouping of similar linguistic features. Style is the mar material articulation, um, basically the, the, the structure that the author is trying to use to convey their information. And then language type, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So the language type can be ordinary, or it can be more technical, or it can be more poetic. Now, the point here is that all of these are different things. They are not all completely distinct. There's overlap between them. But the key that I want you to get from this is that there are lots of different dimensions of describing a text. If you only describe one of these things, you only know some of what makes it unique. So to illustrate this a little better, we're going to take two of the categories from the previous slide. So this is the literary form and the language type. So th I, this is a really good example, I think, um, because both of these categories have something called poetry, right? So in language, you start with ordinary language, and you can either move um, more figurative towards poetic language, so using metaphors, for example, or you can move more technical if you're writing in a law journal or a scientific article, that's more technical. Now, on the other hand, we have literary form. Literary form, uh, there's a whole bunch of different uh, categories of this. So um, I chose a few examples on here. So for example, you can have lyric poetry. Now, the, this is actually an example that John Collins uses. So you'll notice here, I have two songs written on this column for lyric poetry. The first is My Life Would Suck Without You, which is a Kelly Clarkson song. And Collins makes the point that this is a song, so it is, by definition, this is poetry, like it is a poem that you sing, and yet it is written in very ordinary language. There's nothing poetic about the language in the song. This is probably the feature of most songs that we're familiar with today. So you can have a poem that is not written in poetic language. You can also have a, something that's not a poem that is written in poetic language. So this is an important distinction to make here, that the type of language and the literary form are two different things. So you can't equate them with each other. So just because you showed that something has poetic language does not make it a poem. Just because you sh showed that something is not a poem does not mean it does not have poetic language. Everybody following with that? Okay. So how can we understand what a text is? So after that discussion, we're going to focus primarily here on the idea of genre, okay? So genre is basically a grouping of texts that all have similar structure, language, purpose, and audience, okay? So you remember our uh, scholar ease definition down there, which is a little bit more precise, um, but I tried to convey it in a way that's not so hard to understand. So the idea here is that the genre is part of the shared understanding um, that the author has with their audience. So when you read Harry Potter, you immediately understand something about the genre of, you know, kind of narrative fiction in, you know, 21st century English-speaking world. So there's a whole lot of things that you don't even think about in Harry Potter that maybe somebody in 2,000 years will struggle with because they, they don't understand that genre, right? So when you, when you know the genre, you import a lot of outside information to help you understand it. And again, genre is not equal to literary form. It's not equal to style. It's not equal to register. It's not equal to language. Although all of those things might be 
part of the genre. Like a, a genre might have features uh, of all those things, but they're, those terms are not the same thing. They're not equal. So here's an example from the Bible. From the heaven, the stars fought, and from their courses, they fought against Sisera. Judges 5.20. What on earth does that mean? <laughs> right? Now, if you read a little bit more in context, you'll get a little bit better understanding what it is. Uh, but if you read even more, you'll realize that in Judges 4, it actually provides a different account of this same battle. This is a battle. Um, but it provides it in more ordinary language. So this is a poetic description of a battle. And in another place in Judges, there is the historic description of the battle. And they say very different things, but they're conveying the same general events. But this is using highly poetic language. So the key here is that if you don't understand what the genre of this is, this is interesting because this is just one chapter, right? If you go to the chapter before, it's a different genre, you know, the kind of localized genre. So you have to understand this genre in order to understand what this means. Mr. Lawson, could you allow me to click forward? Thank you. So I mentioned earlier this idea of world picture. So genre is part of this shared world that the author and the audience have. It's a shared understanding um, that the author does not have to repeat in order to convey part of his message. So he uses a particular, lit particular genre, particular literary form to convey some message. And there's a lot of presuppositions that are built into the genre itself that he doesn't have to convey to his audience because they already understand what the genre is, right? So we have to reconstruct this shared world, including understanding the genre, if we want to really understand how the author is communicating to his audience. So how are we going to do this? Now, there's a lot that we could do, and we could probably spend weeks and weeks and weeks talking about this. There are people who do PhDs just on like a very small part of this whole idea of understanding the ancient Near Eastern world. But we're going to talk about three particular pieces of literature that predate the book of Genesis that help us understand the way people in that geographical area, the ancient Near East, uh, wrote about things like origins. So the idea here is that if we can understand what a broader sampling of ancient Near Eastern people did, we might get an insight into what the author of Genesis is trying to do, because this is the world that he lives in. He lives in the world of the ancient Near East. He doesn't live in 21st century America. So the three pieces of literature that are generally believed to be most relevant um, to the content of Genesis 1 to 11 are the Eridu Genesis, which is named after Genesis because it has some similarities, the Atrahasis epic, and the Sumerian king lists. Now, interestingly, a lot of this literature and um, other literature from the ancient Near East, like uh, the Gilgamesh epic, are all interrelated, and they borrow parts of each other um, or are derived from similar um, or prior sources. Um, so that's another thing to think about. These aren't necessarily completely independent things, but they are kind of a fairly consistent uh, description of what the ancient Near Eastern people believed, at least you know, for a period of time. So we're going to ask two different questions. The first is, how does Genesis compare to the literature from the ancient Near East? The second is, how did the people of the ancient Near East understand their literature? In particular, these three things that we're, we're looking at. Okay, so again, this is from John Collins's book. Um, and he makes this nice little table showing some general points of comparison between Genesis 1 to 11 and these three um, pieces of literature. So we're going to talk about all three of these in a little bit more detail. So the Sumerian king list um, is basically a giant genealogical table. Now, uh, I say geneal genealogical. It's not really a genealogy because it's just the kings. It doesn't care about descent necessarily, although many of the kings are descended from each other. The reason this is useful and interesting is because it has a section that comes before a flood, 
and they have very long lifespans, and then there's a section of a flood, and then after the flood, there are a bunch more people, and they all have shorter and shorter and shorter lifespans. So, sound familiar? So, then we have the Atrahasis epoch. So, this doesn't cover creation, but it basically describes, again, a flood story. The gods are mad that humans are too noisy, and so they flood them, and one god in particular saves one guy and maybe some other people with that guy and maybe some animals, um, and then they start things over. And then the Eridu Genesis um, actually does talk about the original creation, um, and then for some reason things go bad, and again, flood, man on boat, saved, um, and then some kind of new, new thing happening. Um, so you can see the main part of this that is, you know, parallel to the Bible story, which is the flood part. Um, the rest of Genesis 1 to 11 has fewer parallels, but there still may be things that help us uh, understand what we're, what we're looking at. So the Eridu Genesis. So basically what happens here is you have a group of gods. This is important. Their names are An, Enlil, Anki, and Ninur Saga. And they basically make people. This is just the first line. Now, one thing to remember with all of these texts, we don't have complete copies. So you can see here a picture, actually, of this, of the tablet that this is on. Notice what part is missing and what part's always missing it. It's like the corners. So you always pretty much are missing, like, the first few lines. So in this case, we don't know exactly the very beginning, and um, we don't know exactly, um, well, I mean, there's probably a lot more that is missing, too. You can see the whole right-hand side, there's lines that are cut off. And so if you actually were to read through all my slides, you'll see places where it just says dot, 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 and then like two words and dot, dot, dot. It's because there are sections that we don't know what they said. Uh, this one in particular, because I think this is the only copy of this. Um, so basically, they create, create man, um, and it also describes them creating wild animals. So this is the closest thing you get to Genesis 1 and 2, really. Go ahead. Ooh, I forgot to put this on here. Um, maybe somebody Google that. I have it on at least one of the others. At least I think the king list, I have a date. Let me flip through real quick. Don't have it on here. Yeah, so the king list is you know, almost 3000 BC. Uh, the Eredu Genesis, I don't recall, but I think these are all greater than 2000 BC. Somebody can Google that, though. It should be easy to find. Uh, also, a bunch of these have multiple copies. This one, I think, only has one. Atrahasis has numerous, and the king lists have, like, 11 copies. So, um, okay, after they create man, uh, something makes them decide they don't like man anymore, and so uh, a god said they decide to wipe out mankind. One god in particular says, uh, by, our ha by our hand we will sweep out over the cities of the half bushel baskets in the country, the decision that mankind is to be destroyed was made. Uh, and then it says, a flood came and swept over all uh, the cities for seven days and seven nights. And then the wind had tossed the big boat out over the great waters. So we actually missed some of the story before this where it talks about building a boat. Um, but when we get to here, there's a guy in a boat on the water. 1600. So if you're familiar with the timelines for the Exodus, the early date for the Exodus, Exodus is something like 1500s, right? Um, so this would be, from the earliest possible um, date for the Pentateuch, this would be, you know, 100 years before. And then we have Atrahasis. So this is much more complete and a much longer um, story, and I believe there are multiple versions of this. Again, we have the creation of man. This is a little bit more detailed, though, when it talks about creation of man. Specifically, what happens is originally the big gods create a bunch of little gods. Those little gods are like having to dig rivers and build mountains on the earth. So they're doing manual labor, and they don't like this. So they rebel against the big gods. And um, instead of trying to like fight a war, big gods versus little gods, they decide, okay, how about you just you know, give us one of your little gods. We'll kill him. We'll split his body open, mix it with some mud and some spit, and we'll use that to make people. And so that's what they do. They take clay and stuff and the, the blood of this god, and they mix it together, mold it into people. Um, 
so then once they do that, again, they decide that, uh, in this case, I think they decided the people were too noisy, so they're going to destroy all of the people. Um, so again, they say they're gonna, there's going to be a, a flood. Um, in this case, one god, Anki, talks to um, Atrahasis and tells him to flee your house, build a boat, and uh, save your life, basically. And then gives him some instructions about how to build the boat. Um, so they built the boat. They put some. He killed some animals, presumably for meat, on the boat, and he took other animals onto the boat with him. Um, and then the flood came, and again for seven days and seven nights there was a flood. Sixteen thirty. So about the same time as the writ of Genesis. So. Um, The last thing that's kind of interesting in Atrahasis is that after this point, they set limits on life and population of humans to prevent them from being too noisy again. So um, the part of the text that remains basically says that now um, women will have miscarriages and and babies will die and and things like that so that there won't be quite so many people. Um, And then the the section that's missing, apparently there's been a newer um, manuscript found. Um, And so I have a quote here from some random scholar that says, scholars now agree that the damaged text near the end of the epic refers to the God's decision to institute death as a normal end to human life. The the restoration is supported by newly discovered piece of Sumerian texts. So again, you have the situation where they're imposing... um, you know, limitations on mankind after the fall uh, in terms of their lives. The last thing is the Sumerian king list. So again, this is not a big epic. Interestingly, the king lists or documents like this are actually incorporated into Atrahasis um, and, and the Red of Genesis, I think, um, before the flood. Uh, but they're missing, so I think you only get like the little the edges of them, basically, to see that. Um, basically here, I already told you what this is. You have a long list of kings. So the left-hand column is before the flood. They have incredibly long reigns, tens of thousands of years. Then you have the flood, top right line of the right-hand column. And then after that, their reigns decrease. Initially, there's still a thousand years. This goes on for another several pages like this, eventually getting down to normal lifespans and people that we know to be historical like Sargon. So, broadening a little bit, there are other, um, other creation accounts as well, um, but several of these have these similar features from the, in the ancient Near East, where you have some kind of creation, you have a fall. Um, this is something I haven't talked about, but um, Akhat and Gilgamesh, um, there's parts of those that talk about uh, basically being offered or seeking eternal life and then losing that for some reason, which is a little bit similar to Genesis. Um, lots of stories of the flood, and then these genealogies, um, which have significant parallels in Genesis as well. So, now let's start to get to why we're really here. So, how does this actually compare to Genesis? So, I didn't read these for you, but if you look at them, there are some obvious thematic and kind of story-based similarities but there are some huge differences too. So the first one is that there is only one God in Genesis, right? This is a incredibly striking difference if you compare it to any of the things we just looked at. So there's a radical divergence from the literature of the time, just in that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Right there, radically different. Genesis is a little bit less fantastic than these myths. Seems to be a little bit res- more reserved. Um, but again, the theology is very different. And, and I think arguably there's more theology in Genesis there, than there are in these, in these myths. Arguably, I think. I'm not an expert though. So, Now on the other hand, there are a lot of similarities. So there are fantastic elements that are similar between these. Things like talking serpents. Maybe even the existence and the identity of the cherubim. Uh, I think though is debatable. Um, They also have a similar interest in grounding the present reality in a primordial past. 
Additionally, uh, there are the obvious similarities with the flood, um, but also similarities with things like molding man out of the dirt or out of clay. You know, literally a god with his hands sculpting a man. And importantly, these myths that I just showed you, as well as Genesis, have these genealogical elements that tie the mythic stories to people that are ultimately historical. You know, somewhere down the line of genealogies, there are historical people, which is interesting and is unique to these myths. Like, that's not something that's found in other cultures' myths, where you have genealogies that actually tie to historical things. So, is Genesis a myth? Right? This is the bugbear word. Right? If you say Genesis is a myth, that means it's obviously not historical, and you're probably not a Christian. So, caveat there, the word myth can be used in a lot of different ways. Now, we, for this conversation, are going to refer to the word myth in the context of literary form or genre. So, Genesis 1-11 to is a myth in the sense that it does the same thing to the same audience that these other ancient Near Eastern myths are doing. So it is similar to them. They're doing the same thing. And it appears like some of the differences between them are actually intentionally um, using that genre to draw different conclusions compared to other ancient Near Eastern myths. So the definition that we're going to use here is uh, that a myth is a sacred narrative which explains how the world and man came to be in their present form. So Genesis 1-11 to meets that definition. It doesn't say anything about the historicity or the literality of it at this point. It just says this is the grouping of texts that we can say this is most similar to. Now, so myth is a genre, and the author of Genesis might be using that genre. But why? Why is, why is the author using this mythic genre? More importantly, if it is a, quote, myth, what does that say about how it should be interpreted? Is it historical? How did other ancient cultures view their own myths? So these are the questions we're going to try to attack here. So how did ancient people understand their literature? This is very hard, in particular when you're talking about the ancient Near East. We have these texts and, you know, a variety of others, but we don't have any text that is like somebody laying down a treatise of how to interpret the myth of Atrahasis, right? So we can't really directly answer this question in, in the con, uh, context of the ancient Near East. We can, though, ask what more modern, um, non, uh, like, you know, early, earlier cultures um, have, you, have done with their myths. And so there are comparative studies that have looked at this. So there are a couple of um, features that are very common among, me, among myths. These are flexibility and plasticity. So the idea here is that a myth is flexible insofar as it will change over time, and the, the members of the culture are okay with that. Like the, the changing of the myth over time is part of the myth. Like that's just the way it is. At the same time, there's plasticity, which says that a myth can exist in multiple variations at the same time. And they can have apparently contradictory content, but that the culture will both see both will see both versions as a correct representation of the myth. So what this suggests is that cultures that use myth, you know, this kind of more traditional type of myth don't view them as being completely uh, literal in terms of history, um, or I guess in terms of details, right? There's some major thing that they're trying to convey with it, and as long as that central, me um, central message is conveyed, the details surrounding it are less important. So the question is, to what extent does that apply to Genesis? So... Now, we just talked about myth, but I also told you that Genesis, as well as the Eridu Genesis, have these genealogies. And these genealogies actually 
ultimately tie to people that are historical, that we know are historical. Um, and there's a lot of people that the author clearly believed were, in, were historical. So it's not just myth, where there's maybe some kind of uh, theme or general broad idea that's trying to be gotten across. There are actual historical touch points as well. At least that it seems to be what the author is trying to convey. Um, so we could change this genre name from myth to mytho-history, where mythic elements are woven into a real timeline uh, with presumed historic people. This genre was originally identified by Torkild Jakobsen, um, and he, he created this to describe the Eridu Genesis, as well as its similarities to the book of Genesis, because they have this unique real timeline with real people which is, it's very unusual for myths. So, okay, we just said a whole lot of stuff. I just said a whole lot of stuff. And you might be wondering, um, am I going off the deep end, right? I don't have expertise in literally any of these areas. For those of you who don't know, I'm a biomedical engineer. So I have no, none of this. I'm not an expert on anything. I'm not even particularly well educated on most of these things. Um, but here are a couple of uh, Old Testament scholars, like John Collins, who also agree with this type of idea about the genre of Genesis 1 to 11. So the first is Gordon Wynnum. So uh, he's an Old Testament commentator. Um, you probably have heard it. Some of you have probably heard his name before. He's fairly well known. Um, I didn't write down where he teaches, but he teaches somewhere. Um, his comment is that this idea of mytho-history is a sensitive analysis of both texts, that is Genesis and the Eridu Genesis. Um, but myth is a loaded term which leads to misunderstandings. That's why I prefer proto-history. So Wynnum is going to like this term proto-history, but he's basically just dropping it in place of mytho-history. If we take these stories as straightforward history, Wynnum cautions, we may be forced to conclude that Genesis is trying to relate a history, but not succeeding, which would be a rather negative conclusion. Another expert here, this is Bill Arnold. So he's at Asbury Seminary in Wilmington, Kentucky, another evangelical Old Testament scholar. In the words of William Lane Craig, he has a little bit more temerity than Gordon Wynnum. He says, these chapters are no simple history or example of ancient historiography. Rather, they are a histori historicizing literary form using genealogies especially to make history out of myth. The primeval history nar narrates those themes in a way that transforms their meaning and import, and for reasons we may think, uh, and for these reasons we may think of these chapters as a unique literary category, which some have termed mytho-historical. So this isn't completely out of left field. Um, there are quite a few people who accept this type of character characterization of Genesis. Elite Genesis 1 to 11. Okay, so I said we we're going to have a really long time on this first part. So that's the end of the first part. So what is Genesis? What do we have, like actually have in the text? So Genesis has similarities to ancient Near Eastern myths, but also important differences. It's mostly narrative, but it also contains genealogies, which show an historical interest. We may term the genre mytho-history or proto-history. But what does it do? So if you want to read Colin's book, he has just as long, if not longer, a discussion on this, but I think this is less controversial. Genesis is meant to convey important theological truths. That first one is that there is one God. All of the components of nature that God is making, God is making. They are creatures. They are not God. They are not gods. In all these other myths, you'll have a plethora of gods, and they're usually tied to different features of nature. Additionally, it grounds the present reality of the Israelites in the primordial past. So there's a continuous story in Genesis and in the, in the Pentateuch, and this takes that back all the way to the beginning. 
Additionally, it shows that God is not just the God of Israel, but it's the, he's the God of the whole world. Genesis 1 to 11 is before Abraham. So most uh, commentators agree that that first 11 chapters, the purpose of it is to show that God is interested in all of humanity, not just Israel, not just the children of Abraham. Because it started with everybody, and as he slowly tried different people to, to redeem the world, he wound up with Abraham. And then eventually Abraham, you know, created one nation that God was particularly interested in, and then from that nation comes Christ, and then we're back out to reaching the whole world. So it introduces this story of redemption in human history. So how is it used? So the Pentateuch as a whole, Genesis through Deuteronomy, functions as somewhat of a constitution for the nation of Israel. Um, It's intended to shape Israel's, and thus our, view of the world. So this is a radically different introduction to what the world is compared to these ancient Near Eastern myths. Genesis is meant to draw that distinction to the minds of of the early Israelites so that they can see that they view the world differently. So it creates this different view of the world. So this is what the author is trying to do. Um, And again, it presents a, a... unified story from the beginning of Genesis to the end of the Pentateuch, and really the Bible as a whole kind of ties this whole into one big story. Okay, so we now know how to understand Genesis. Maybe? Probably not. What do you think? Raise your hand if you know what Genesis means now. Maybe a little bit. Okay, so... As you all know, next week our topic is going to be specifically Genesis and its relationship to science. So we're going to use this as an example of kind of delving a little bit into the application here. We're not going to get into specifics because Zach or myself will do that next week. Um, But we're going to see about applying these ideas and what that really means. So first of all, let's try to kind of summarize and combine everything we just talked about. So when you're looking at Genesis, you need to think about the genre. Texts are written by people and they're written for people. You need to think about the author and the audience in their shared world. How did they understand the text? This needs to be the starting point because God uses people to make texts. He doesn't dictate them. So the people, their environment, the way they think is going to, that's going to be the way they convey their meaning. So you have to try to understand that. We need to answer those three questions from C.S. Lewis. What is it? What does it do? And how is it used? So we've kind of, we've we've introduced all of those things, right? But then some other things. We're going to avoid concordism. So concordism, which I mentioned briefly in one of the earliest slides, is this idea of trying to harmonize science in a way that you're fitting contemporary scientific theories into the text. So... I hate to break it to you, but the author of Genesis, whether it was Moses or somebody else, did not know about the Big Bang. He didn't know about it. He wasn't thinking about it. God didn't, like, make him learn a 21st century astrophysics textbook before he could write Genesis. That's not what Moses is talking about. He's not talking about, he's not referencing our contemporary scientific theories. Later in the Bible, when... um, There's a verse that says the heavens were stretched out like a tent. That is not a reference to the expansion of the universe. The ancient authors were not thinking about the expansion of the universe. Remember, God uses people to write stories. He uses people to write the Bible. He does not impose like secret future knowledge that only an educated 21st century person can extract from the book. This is the other problem with concordism. Eventually, the science becomes out of date. So remember, I said people started this in 1860. In 1860, none of the science we have, we had then. So all that science that they were squeezing into Genesis is wrong. So their interpretation of Genesis was wrong just because their science was wrong. And we don't know what parts of our science are right and what are wrong. So it's a little bit dangerous to be kind of reading those into Genesis. But we still need to seek an integrated faith. What this means is that you can't just bury your head in the sand, ignore what science says, and think that 
you can just kind of live with contradictions, right? If God is real, he created the physical universe, and the universe, physical universe you know, is communicating to us what God did. So ultimately, after you've gone through the interpretive exercise, you have to figure out how can you be integrated in, you know, as a whole person with all aspects of, of your life, including thinking about things in science and things in theology. So I introduced this tug of war. So which side is right? So we're going to do a case study here. So this is one particular view by a, I think, a fairly influential um, guy who works, I think, at Creation Ministries Inter International, I think. So he is a PhD chemist, um, but this book is about the interpretation of Genesis 1 to 11. So um, this is called the Genesis account. So this guy's name is uh, Jonathan Sarfati. So his position is going to be that Genesis 1 to 11 is literal kind of historiography, like a literal straightforward accounting of events, um, just like, you know, a kind of calm-headed depiction of a battle, right? More like uh, the, uh, basically not like that ap apocalyptic imagery that we had of the battle earlier, more like the historical version. So first he's going to say that you have to use the grammatical historical meaning. Like that's what the meaning is, the grammatical historical meaning of the text. Um, unfortunately, this isn't very helpful because even poetry is interpreted that way. So it really doesn't tell us anything useful. Um, next, he says that the genre of Genesis 1 to 11 is history. So he gives three reasons. First, he says that the vav consecutive verb form um, typical of is typical of a historical narrative, and this is what's used when it says, and the earth was uh, formless and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So that's the Vav consecutive. But remember, this is a guy who has a PhD in chemistry. Uh, he's not a Hebrew guy. Secondly, he says that numerical studies of verb forms show that generous, Genesis is narrative and not poetry. So again, plugging in verbs into a computer and saying, do poetry have, does poetry have more verbs or does Genesis have more verbs? Or are they the same? And then lastly, he says that Genesis 1 to 11 is very similar to the historical accounts of things in the Bible. Now, unfortunately, these first two um, are not helpful. This indicates that we have narrative prose. So the whole Vav thing, it sounds fancy because it's in Hebrew, but this is just ba basically saying that, well, if you have sentences that say, and then, and then, and then, you're telling something that has a, a chronological sequence to it. So it's actually a, just an obvious point, but just because it, there's a chronological sequence does not mean that it's historical or ahistorical. It just is unrelated. It just means that it's narrative. Narrative is unrelated to history. So remember we talked about genre and literary form and style and register. So showing that something is narrative does not show that it's history, does not show that it's poetry or that it's not poetry. It just means it's narrative. Um, lastly, the claim that Genesis 1 to 11 is similar to historical books. Um, the problem here is that since, you know, before the time of Christ, the distinction between Genesis 1.11 and Genesis 12 onward was noted because there is a clear difference. Like every commentator in the history of, in the book, uh, every commentator in history on the book of Genesis has pretty much said 1 and 11 is different from 12 onward. Like there's a clear difference. So when he says it's very similar, it's not something that has been shared by the majority of people who have actually read Genesis. That's why we have this whole discussion because Genesis 1 to 11 is weird. It's not what we are used to. Genesis 12 onward is incontroversial because we understand what that is. It's you know, a historical um, description of something. So you know, there's a lot of issues here. So is, histor is history even a re relevant category of genre? Even poems can be historical. So for example, in Exodus 15, there are two historical episodes related in song. 
Um, why are these the only options? So Sarfati says, Genesis is history, not poetry or allegory. So he basically says, those are the three exhaustive options. All human writing must either be history, poetry, or allegory. Right? That's probably not a good distinction because we already have a bunch of examples of things that don't fit in those categories. And these aren't even all talking about the same things. History versus poetry are two different dimensions of that measurement. Because history doesn't have anything to do with literary form, right? Although you could have a literary form that is used for history. Uh, but you get, you get my point. Um, so there's not enough options. Genesis 1 to 11 isn't poetry, although there are elements that are poetic. It's po prose narrative. But prose narrative does not mean history. All of those myths that we talked about are prose narrative. It's unclear that the people who created those myths thought of them as history. It's very easy to at least imagine a situation where somebody were to create a myth and not intend it to be history, right? But it's still a prose narrative. So to draw this out a little bit further, I'm going to pull our little bubble diagram up again. But this time you'll see I've put some biblical examples on here. So we have these two axes. We have our language type and we have our literary form. Now, caveat, this is all coming out of my brain, not an expert's brain. So you can quibble with me all you want on where these things are. But the point is looking at it with this type of a lens. Thinking about this language and the literary form as being different. You'll notice that Genesis 1 to 11 I've placed as prose narrative, but I've also placed it as being fairly poetic because it's near the top. We can talk a little bit about why that is. There are some poetic elements. Um, I found an interesting uh, paper actually by another guy from Asbury Seminary today talking about poetic elements in uh, Genesis 1 to 11. But it's not a poem, but it's still poetic. Some other examples you can see we have the Psalms are frequently very poetic. Um, they're lyric poetry. Some Psalms are more poetic, some are less. Ecclesiastes, this is a prose discourse, but also it's very poetic. Whereas Leviticus is prose discourse and it's very technical in some sections because it's law. So to kind of wrap this up a little bit, um, genre and literary form and style and register and language are all different things. Just because you show that one thing, you know, that something is a partic particular literary form does not tell you what the genre is necessarily. Um, Genesis is written po poetic, uh, poetic language. For example, um, there's word play and assonance in the, the actual writing. Um, there are extended metaphors. For example, divine anthropomorph anthropomorphism. So Christian theology, we all know that God doesn't have a body. But Genesis 1 to 11 portrays him as a human, literally bending down into the dirt and molding a man like a sculptor and walking in the coolness of the garden, right? Calling out for Adam, um, you know, why he's hiding. So that's anthropomorphism. That's a metaphor. That doesn't mean we use Genesis to overthrow um, the doctrine that God is, you know, not a physical being. Um, again, Going back to Lewis, we have to answer those three questions. What is it? What is it for? And what does it do? Um, in the case of Genesis, there's no real indication that the author is concerned with communicating science. It's very clear that he's communicating theology that is placed against the ancient Near Eastern backdrop. You know, it's theology in that it is different from Atrahasis. It's different from Gilgamesh. It's different from all these other narratives. But it doesn't seem like he's particularly interested in teaching about the order things were created in, for example. There are little inconsistencies and in things in the, in the written record that can be explained away, but the author doesn't attempt to explain them because it seems like he doesn't really care. He's not worried about those details. He's worried about a message that he's trying to get across. So... We talked about how to get from God to the written word. Now we're talking about how to get from the written word to meaning. So remember, this is all about understanding the shared world that the audience and the author live in and trying to understand that so that you can actually get into their minds and try to figure out what the author was really trying to accomplish and what their goal was 
what they're trying to convey. Okay, that's it, guys. Now all I have left is a summary. Before I get to the summary, do we have any comprehension questions or concerns? So basically, we, we say that we like don't try to like read science or whatever it means to us, right? And okay, that's fine. Um, but I, I think it is generally well agreed upon in the Christian community, whether young or older, that Genesis implies that the universe was created at some point, right? In time. So let's say that like science were to come to a new theory and it was almost in some sort of way like uh, difficult to reject that the universe is co-eternal with God, right? As some current scientists do feel. What would you say about that? Well, you know, this is interesting because the scientific... Yeah, I can, I can repeat that. So the question was, um, Christian theology has been unanimous that Genesis means that at some point God created the world and the universe, right? God created everything. It has a finite past. What happens if a scientific theory poses that the universe is infinite in some way? Now, um, interestingly, until the 1950s, this was the unanimous belief of all of science, from you know the pre-Socratic philosophers up to you know Leibniz, you know. So, um, and, and Einstein. I mean, he was not happy that his theory of relativity showed everything was going to explode outward or crunch inward, right? So, um, you know, Christianity has dealt with that for a long time. Um, in the past, Christians have kind of retreated a little bit and said, well, maybe the universe is eternal. Um, you can see that in like, for example, Leibniz's argument, uh, cosmological argument doesn't use the beginning point in time to argue for a be uh, the existence of God. He uses like a, a metaphysical reliance on God. But, um, but I think it's, I think it's clear that it teaches that there's a beginning, right? God created it. He created everything. Like, if, if Genesis is meaning to teach anything, it's that God created all of these things. Because in those other myths, those other things are other gods, or they're things that the other gods do. And Genesis is clearly drawing a distinction there that, no, God created all of these things. There are no other gods. You know, these, these natural processes aren't gods. These are things that God has created. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. So I intentionally did not give you... Oh, so the question was, um, where do you draw the line? Like, what particular elements of the text are, are meant to be taken literally, like as a message, and what, what things aren't? And I, I'm not trying to tell you what I think that is. I frankly don't know. Um, I, I don't think there's an easy answer there. I mean, there are some easy answers. Creation of the world is obvious, right? That's an obvious message. Um, the fact that there are no other gods is an obvious message. To, next week, we'll talk about some scientific things. So we're going to talk about Adam. It, it may not be that the Genesis narrative commits you to a literal Adam, but the New Testament does. And we'll talk about that a little next week. Um, but when it comes to something like the flood, I don't know what to do with the flood. Um, I think the genealogies commit you that those people are real people. Was there a flood? I tend to think so, but I, I don't think that you can, just given the genre of, the, of, of Genesis, I'm not sure that you can presume upon those sorts of details, right? Um, but I'm also not particularly, I don't have a well-formed view on all the details of Genesis um, because it's very complicated. from like the reading Collins and the other guys, do they find it helpful to in interpreting Genesis to look at like the other creation passages like like I guess Job or others that have like a creation poetry or narrative that and then they can do that do, does that inform it at all? Yeah, so this is an important point. So the question was what about other places in the Bible that are of relevance to the particular topics in Genesis. So um, I have attempted here to talk only about Genesis 1 to 11. So that we, you know, basically you start with looking, what does Genesis 1 to 11 say for sure? And then you can look kind of further and further into, into the Bible, because there are lots of other passages that relate to different parts of this, right? 
So I already mentioned Adam, for example. There are some really nice things in the New Testament that kind of lay out the theology of Adam um, that are a lot easier to, to interpret than Genesis, right? Um, same thing about creation. Creation is mentioned in numerous other places. So when it comes time to build a comprehensive theology, you have to look at all of the Bible. You can't just look at Genesis. But when, it come, when you're looking at just what does Genesis say kind of by itself, uh, you want to take just, you know, just look at Genesis by itself. Especially when you're looking at things that were written after Genesis, right? Um, something that the New Testament authors kind of do is, is they will actually kind of add meanings to the Old Testament. So it's kind of good to be able to trace that idea where you have, you know, something that the Israelites saw and then something where Jesus said that, no, it's actually more than that, right? But the original audience wouldn't have got that. They didn't get that because they didn't expect Jesus, did they? Go ahead. On your slide, point three says um, Genesis is not derived from other A and E myths. Um, and so, when you get to something like that, how could you, I guess, defend the argument on where the line is drawn? Because obviously, there's a very similar mirroring between the four mm -hmm. scripts. So this is so, a good question. So the question is, um, in reference to one of my points in the slide. So let me go through these now. Then, uh, all these, I have two slides of these kind of takeaways. Um, I'll start with this one though. So. The three main things that I think are good takeaways here, and then I'll answer your question in the context of three. The first one is that you have to put yourself into the shoes of the ancient author and audience. I think I've said that a dozen times now, so you should all get that. Um, which means you have to understand their shared world. Secondly, you need to cooperate with the author to discover their meaning. Sometimes people will say things like, well, I try first to take a text literally, then I try to take it non-literally if that doesn't work. Um, basically trying to, trying to articulate a default position. But this isn't right because the author is not, doesn't have a default position. Whatever position he chooses is the right one, and you have to discover that right one. Going wrong in any way is failing to cooperate with the author. So you don't, we don't get to have a default position, a default way of reading it. We have to figure out what the, author, the way the author wanted us to read it. Like, it's just the way it is. Um, lastly, uh, Genesis 1 to 11 is related in some way to other A and E texts, ancient Near Eastern texts, but the nature of the relationship is complicated. Um, so, themes and episodes from ancient Near Eastern literature are present in Genesis 1 to 11. So, lots of themes, like um, kind of a, a failed attempt at achieving immortality, um, but there are also specific episodes, the flood being the main one like very similar between a whole bunch of different texts. Now, Genesis is not derived in the terms of like copying from ancient Near Eastern texts. Um, in the past, this would have been something that some Old Testament scholars would say, um, but I think it's just been, you know, basically given up on at this point with one exception, and that is the flood story in particular the part about the releasing of the birds. Now, this is because, so all the things we've talked about so far, the texts we talked about, have um, you know, pretty similar stories in terms of like the general idea, but the words are all completely different. Now, in the case of the bird incident, there is a version of Atrahasis that contains a very similar incident. At the end of, um, uh, importantly, actually, from what I understand, the flood is not in the earliest parts of the earliest copies of Atrahasis. So there's some that don't have it at all. The, uh, it's not at all in uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh until much later. Then in Atrahasis, in one of the oldest ones, it added this episode about the bird where before making landfall, the Noah character, Atrahasis, releases birds, which, um, and he did like a dove, a raven, and something else, three different birds. Um, he, you know, sent them out and to see if uh, they would bring back something to show that there was land or something like that, right? Basically what happens in the biblical story. Now, what's interesting here is that the dating of that is quite late, um, I don't remember exactly what the date is, but I think it's more in line with like the exile, which is like what, the 500s BC? 
um, or per perhaps a little bit before that. So um, there is an argument that those two particular small sections are so similar that there might have been copying. So this is derivation, right? However, it's actually timeline-wise possible that that could have gone the other direction from Genesis to the Atrahasis story. Um, and then later, that final version was ultimately incorporated into the Gilgamesh story too. Um, but again, even that was even much later after that. So um, the question of borrowing is, is a little bit complicated. So clearly the flood story is something that a lot of cultures were using in myths, right? I mean, we, we saw three examples that mention this. Um, what that means is harder to say, right? What does that mean that the author was trying to convey? What does that mean that all these other authors were trying to convey? Like, why, why is it in there? I don't have an answer. You might try reading the literature to see if somebody has an answer. I'm sure lots of people have answers, and I'm sure they're all different. Go ahead. Whenever here it says that, um, so basically, God like, God like speaking the whole entire world into existence. There is one ancient Near Eastern parallel, and, and nowhere else in the entire ancient Near East is it found except for the Memphite theology in, in, in ancient Egypt, where Toth speaks the whole entire world into being. So the, the ancient Israelite is going to be familiar with these other stories. And what the author of Genesis is doing is they're taking out Toth and then they're putting in Yahweh. And so what, what they're doing is they're, is they're like taking shots at other ancient Near Eastern uh, gods and, and kicking out those gods and then putting in Yahweh. So also Yahweh splitting it to be like um, the like upper waters from the lower waters. That in Enuma Elish is Marduk who does that because he's like um, he's well like he, splits, he splits he uh, splits Tiamat in half. It's a dragon, so a little different, but but yeah, but like uh, Tiamat, she is primordial chaotic water, and so uh, here God also ruling over the sea. Yam in ancient Ugaritic is the exact same word in the in the biblical text. And so ancient Israelites know who Yom is, and Baal defeats Yom to become the ruler. Of yeah, so this is, uh, so I guess to kind of repeat this, um, he's pointing out a variety of potential connections to kind of a wider set of ancient Near Eastern contexts, as well as Egyptian, um, not just Mesopotamian, but Egyptian as well. And there's a couple things about that. So, um, there's, so the, the first idea, which was basically using um, all of these, so this is something that's actually interesting in, in Hebrew, that a lot of God, divine names um, for like these polytheistic gods are just like common words. So you can really easily, in a lot of the Old Testament actually, read in divine names to common words um, in a passage, which just significantly changes the meaning because now all of a sudden, instead of talking about like an arrow being knocked out of the air, you're talking about um, a god which is being defeated. So um, this is something that you can talk about actually with a lot of the Old Testament. In the case, in the specific case of the Egyptian parallel, um, there's a little bit of, I don't, I don't think that it's commonly accepted that the Egyptian mythologies are particularly relevant. That's what's proposed in this book. In the beginning, we misunder misunderstood. So they're basically saying that all of Genesis 1 to 11 is a, a kind of an Egyptian polemic, where they're taking these Egyptian things, an Egyptian creation story, and, um, and they are, like you said, replacing all the things that those gods did and all the things that were gods with Yahweh and with what, well, Elohim, with what Elohim is doing, right? Um, so that's the idea. Um, now, I think at least William Lame Craig, I think, makes a fairly compelling argument that it's hard to do this for the Egyptian stuff because, at least in the case of what these three guys did, or these two guys did, Miller and Soden, they um, basically have to create an Egyptian creation myth because we don't, we don't really have one. Uh, so the problem with Egypt is that we have tons of writing, but it's all written on monuments and things like that. Because their, their uh, like paper writings were on papyrus, which don't survive. Whereas in the ancient Near East, we had a lot of cuneiform tablets, which are made of clay and things that are more likely to survive over a long period of time. Um, so we don't, we don't have a full account of an Egyptian creation. We have like little excerpts from you know, 
three or four different cult centers over like a 3,000 year period. So it's really hard to draw the parallels, but that is what these guys think. They think that all of Genesis is basically a polemic against the Egyptian um, uh, theology, basically. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said. There are, you, you can draw a lot of little parallels. So part of the problem too is that um, the Semitic languages are all interrelated, right? Ugaritic and Hebrew and uh, what are some of the others? Hurrian, that's actually not related. But basically there's a bunch of Semitic languages. They're all related. They all share words or have loan, you know, loaned words um, or they have words that kind of derive from the same thing but now mean different things. So you can really easy draw, easily draw a lot of parallels. One of the, the points though that Craig makes is to be careful about going too far when, with drawing parallels. For example, if you want to talk about um, the earth being, or like the initial point of creation being from uh, chaotic waters, you can find this in Chinese and Native, uh, Native American myths, which are obviously not related to Genesis. There was obviously no b borrowing there. I mean, you'd have to posit some really strange things. So there's a lot of weird similarities between myths of cultures that have never had contact. So you have to do a little bit more than kind of isolated linguistic similarities. Craig gives a great example, actually, of an uh, ancient Near Eastern scholar who talks about a component from, um, the, from Gilgamesh, where Gilgamesh's friend Enkidu um, basically spends seven days with a prostitute and gains wisdom from that. And this, uh, this scholar says that this is clearly um, something that Genesis rearranges into the institution of marriage. So there's a seven-day thing, and there's like a man and a woman. But other than that, there really are no parallels. So you have to be careful. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of attempts to try to draw parallels. But what I tried to show you today, those three are by most scholars of this time, th those three pieces of literature are deemed to be the most relevant. The Enuma Elish, um, like 40 or 50 years ago, was thought to be really relevant, but I think nowadays um, they're more interested in the Eridu Genesis and in the Atrahasis. Um, but the Enuma Elish is interesting if you want to read about Tiamat uh, being split in half and creating the sky and you know, all sorts of things. Um, but that's actually about the god Marduk. So. So I do have one more takeaway slide. So four more things. So number four, some Old Testament scholars classify Genesis as mytho-history. So we've talked about the technical word myth does not imply falsehood, um, but it implies a particular genre. Um, importantly, mytho-history does tie to, you know, in this weird way, unusual way, to historical people which is unique for these few texts. Um, if Genesis is mytho-history, we cannot just assume that details are intended as historical in a straightforward manner, at least. Now, this does not mean that anything in particular is not historical in Genesis. It just means that you can't assume it, that there is some weight on the scale saying that you should be wary about how you view specific details of the story of Genesis. Mytho-historical gen genre does not extend beyond Genesis 11. So if you're worried about this like influencing Jesus, uh, the Gospels are ancient biography in the style of the lives by Plutarch. It, they are not mytho-history, even remotely. Um, even Genesis 12 onward is not mytho-history. Um, lastly, after we understand the author's meaning, what do New Testament authors have to say? And, and as Julie said, what do other Old Testament authors have to say? So probably even the first one is the Pentateuchal author himself, who in Exodus um, says just as um, the heaven and, heavens and the earth were created in seven days, and then he talks about the work week for the Israelites. So you have to go beyond Genesis 1 to 11 to interpret it, but you got to start there and kind of take it at face value first. Okay, so next week we are going to move beyond talking about texts and we're going to talk about the way different people have interpreted Genesis 1 to 11 
in the context of particular views on science. And we basically have four questions that we're going to address. How old is the universe or Earth? How is life interrelated? How did life diversify? And how did humanity originate? This is actually going to take two weeks. We're going to deal with the first three questions next week, and we'll deal with Adam and Eve the last week. Well, in two weeks. It's not, we have many more weeks after that, but we'll be out of Genesis. So, that is it. Um, if there are more questions, feel free. We can keep talking about it um, for a little while. But that is it for my content. Well, let's see if there's any more questions. Go ahead. Context is, um, and we have access to the context that we can get by simply reading the Bible. But what about outside cultural context? Um, how can we know what context we're missing if we don't even know that we're missing context? <laughs> yeah, that's good. So the question was, how do we get more context for? Um, I assume you're talking in, in particular about Genesis one to eleven. So. Um, you know, in, in, in specifically, you said like social context, right? I think the key there is that you need to, to read some things by Old Testament scholars who know what they're talking about. Um, so somebody like John Collins, so remember he was part of the, uh, translate, the head of the translation team for the ESV Old Testament. Um, he was also in charge of creating the study notes for the study Bibles. So when you read an ESV and you read comments from him, you know, he knows what he's talking about. Um, so usually in a study Bibles and things like that, they try to pull on that sort of information, but some are better than others. So you have to take, um, I think one, you have to recognize that you don't know the context completely. So you have to be, you, you can't be dogmatic, especially with Genesis 1 to 11. There's been disagreement about Genesis 1 to, Genesis 1 to 11 since before the time of Christ. <laughs> So you you can't be dogmatic about it. You have to recognize there's things that you don't know and probably that none of us know. Uh, But then, yeah, reach out to to people who know what they're talking about. Um, Yeah. Well, a question that just to challenge you. How do we know that these people actually know what they're talking about? That's another good question. So it's kind of a chicken and an egg problem, right? So once you are familiar with the space, you kind of know what the lay of the land is, right? Um, but you got to start somewhere. Um, personally, I would start with people like John Collins, Mike Heiser, um, William, w- William Lane Craig is not an expert in this, but he um, is, provides good interaction with a variety of the experts. Um, but basically, I, I think the main thing is don't first go to a theologian. Go first to the person who studies those ancient texts and those ancient cultures. So usually they'll call themselves an Old Testament scholar or something like that. Um, And if you're worried about, you know, not following behind somebody who's super liberal or something like that, you can look at what um, seminary they go to or what seminary they teach at and things like that. Um, But even better, if you know somebody personally who has done a little bit of reading, use them as your entry point instead of just kind of randomly Googling stuff, right? Um, Because it's hard. If you Google stuff, you're going to find a ton of junk. Like 99% of what you find is junk because very few people actually go out and read like this book that I have been talking about. Um, Very few people read that, but a lot of people still talk about stuff like this, right? Um, And again, I'm not an expert in any of this, but um, I like to think that I've at least been exposed to enough of it to have kind of a taste for it, you know, just the tiny bit. Any other questions? Sounds like Winnie has a question back there. Well, in that case, I think we are done. It took us an hour and 38 minutes, which is probably longer than I was supposed to take, but I hope you guys enjoyed.